Dr. Nikolai also serves as the current president of IELTS, the International Association for Language Learning Technology. Today, he will share with us a platform he developed for second language pronunciation instruction, assessment, and research. Please help me welcome Dr. Nikolai. Thank you, thank you. I couldn't have said that better myself, so that was perfect, almost like I wrote it. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, like Angelica said, I'm Dr. Dan Nikolai. I work at St. Louis University, uh, SLU for short, if, I, if you hear me use that acronym. So let's, let's jump right into it. And I wanna start my talk with a little bit of background, right, as, as one does. Uh, and this is actually in honor of Angelica. I'm using a meme, right? Because every time she sends me an email, it's very meme heavy, <laughs> right? So, and maybe you've seen this one, so forgive me if you have. Um, have the image number one, Spanish and Italian. Just pronounce it as it's written. The H is silent. You're set. Okay. Level two here. English, many letters can be silent. Many words have their own rules. And then we, then we get to the language that I teach, and maybe you have seen this. <laughs> Every letter is meaningless. Every living thing is born without a reason, right? And I start with this because I often feel like this is how my students, uh, that's how they confront French, right? The, the letters and the sounds, nothing makes any sense to them. And uh, my colleagues, this was not lost on my colleagues. And if several years ago, my department decided to address this, this issue in the department. And we offered a, uh, what's the English? Corrective phonetics uh, for French. And what was shocked us was this course uh, was over-enrolled because we opened it up to everybody in the French curriculum. So French, uh, basically second semester through our graduate program, because everybody, many people had an interest in refining their French accent, right? To sound, sound more French, to improve their French. So we offered this course and we're trying to address one problem and we created another problem and that was we had all of these students in this class. And, you know, when you're when you're working with uh, pronunciation, really, it's best to kind of have a one on one thing. Right. And you also want whatever feedback you give your students to uh, happen quickly. And that is not always possible. Now, I have been doing the Language Resource Center gig for a long time and I have these memories of, you know, students in a, in a giant lab kind of listening and repeating, listening and repeating, listening, repeating, and we would record those. We record those, but guess what? How did those students get feedback from us? Okay, the very best case scenario was we would listen to the recording and we would give them feedback maybe that day, maybe the next day, maybe a week later, maybe never, often, often never. Right. So we had all these students. We wanted to teach this pronunciation course, essentially, but we also wanted feedback to to be uh, immediate and meaningful uh, and also individualized. So when I have these adjectives in my head, I immediately think, like, let's let's automate this. Let's find some automation. Uh, and that's kind of how my project was born, because we had this you know, convergence. There was a need and there is an opportunity. I'm gonna talk about those two things now. So the need, some of the bad things, is in our program, we had these persistent pronunciation problems with really every level of our courses, and we wanted to address them some way. We had a challenge, again, with the very delayed feedback. Um, I like to remind the teachers that I teach that feedback is a dish best served warm, right? Not weeks later. Uh, and then finally, students come to this endeavor, a lot of speaking anxiety, right? We really need our students to kind of push past uh, the, this, this comfort zone wall, because we know language learning is not going to happen when anxiety is too high, or if you're not willing as a learner to, to leave your comfort zone. So the opportunities, thumbs up. So when we were offering this class, it kind of converged uh, with the same time that Google 
released their multilingual automatic speech recognition uh, tool inside their browser. And so that was kind of in my head. This class was in my head. I'm like, okay, maybe there's some, there's an opportunity here. And there are other vendors at the time when this project started that were offering really, really low cost uh, text to speech. So the synthesized voices that you hear uh, kind of sound, they used to sound very robotic, very mechanical. Uh, over time, they've gotten much better, I must say. So this was another kind of uh, opportunity for us. And finally, I've been very fortunate my entire career to have deep institutional at the university, college, and department level uh, for my crazy projects. Um, some of that support comes from our very own Language Resource Center. Um, but also with a project like this, we knew there would be uh, an opportunity to get external funding. And in, indeed, that is what we ultimately did. So there was the convergence. Now, in my job, as uh, Angelica mentioned, wear a lot of hats, right? And every single thing I do kind of has this uh, three, three perspectives, three lenses that I approach. Every, every aspect of my work is approached with this mindset. And this also corresponds to the stakeholders in, in a project like this. And those stakeholders, of course, are the language learners, the students themselves, right? Key group, key group. Uh, there's the language educators, and of course, we do we do research uh, at my university on language learning, language acquisition, and the impact of technology uh, in that process. So every every kind of component, every aspect was like, okay, how do we do this in a way that meets the needs of all of these three key groups? So now. I'm going to show you a quick demo and walk through some of the features of the platform that was created. Again, originally, uh, the platform was created as just like a proof of concept. Um, I'm like, okay, I'm going to put something together quickly for this group of French learners. Then it kind of got away from me um, and it became much bigger. I, I shared this uh, tool, the French tool, at an IELTS conference uh, in 2015. And there's all this interest, like, hey, does it support Mandarin? Does it do Japanese? Does it do this, this, this? I'm like, well, give me a minute. Uh, we'll, we'll add those things. So uh, the current project, I'll pull this up here. And again, the, the pronunciation is iSprock, rhymes with lock. Uh, and it's at iSprock.net. And I, what I tried to do was kind of retain the, the interface from the first prototype because we had a lot of users um, and I wanted to keep the experience uh, more or less unchanged for them. But the idea is very simple uh, and you can do this. There's, there's no cost, there's no, you don't even need an account to get started. It's very simple. You as the educator, you put your email address in, you decide what language of instruction you have. Uh, currently, iSprock supports 36 different languages and inside those languages, uh, sometimes dozens of regional uh, acoustic models. Like, so especially for a language like Arabic, sounds very different in Morocco than it does in Lebanon. Uh, Spanish as well. If you have a, a Spanish instructor from Argentina, right? Uh, and maybe that's a factor you want to take into account when you're creating these models and where students are practicing. So we'll, we'll show the regional models in a bit. But to get started, we're just going to Everyone speak English? Okay, I meant to check beforehand, but we're good. We'll, we'll start with an English example. And the next uh, field here that I have to choose is iSprock can generate automatically uh, a synthesized voice using text-to-speech, okay? Alternatively, if you want a more natural sounding voice, uh, you can provide your own audio file that you upload in the next screen. Or right now in the browser, you can record your own prompt. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go with the, 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 the easy button here, which is the automated voices. And here I'm just gonna write a short text, okay? Um, and again, we're in English, so let's, uh, he built a 
chip that revolutionized the industry. Okay. And good English detected. Many people will type in Japanese things and it will, yeah, it will yell at you for if you don't have the right language. All right. So you see what I've done. I went to the, I went to the website. I, I typed in just my email address, select a language, text. I'm going to click on make activity and that's it. I'm done. So what I have now is I have a student link that I can copy and paste. And then I have a private uh, instructor link that I'm not going to share, but I'll use to see the progress of the students on any given activity. And then as a student, uh, we'll pretend we're a student. This is the screen they see. And again, this URL I just clicked on, that's the link that gets copied. Uh, the student's instructed to provide their name, their email address, and that's it. The, these, these fields are, you're not required to use uh, a real email address if you have concerns with your university for whatever. You can also always do activities anonymously. There's a little link here. Uh, but if you want to track which student did what, uh, you will, of course, need to have them provide their name. All right, so as a student, I'm going to click Start Activity. Oh, you know what? I meant to type built, but I typed build. So that's, that's my bad English there. But that's going to come in handy, actually. So here I have uh, this, the student screen. And I can actually, I mentioned there were different regional models. So for English, I believe there's six or seven, Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand, South Africa, UK, and the US. And this is for the student to select. So again, if the student is in Australia, you know, uh, this is something they might want to select because that's the variety of English that they are encountering every day. Uh, the text-to-speech, we'll take a quick listen to that. He built a chip that revolutionized the industry. So you can tell it's still a synthetic voice, but it, there's some prosody in the speech. It sounds good. Uh, just a quick comment that the, the voice you heard Actually, it kind of randomly selects between a couple of different voices. So there's there's a more male, masculine voice. There's a more feminine voice uh, that you will hear as you alternate activities. And then the student uh, clicks the microphone and tries to read this sentence here. And I'm going to say built. He built a ship that revolutionized the industry. All right, so I misspoke a little bit on purpose. But you saw as I was speaking, uh, the transcription appeared. Now, I think that's so cool, um, yes. right? That as you speak, you, you could see the text because text, especially if you're familiar with the, the script of a language, it's, it's meaningful right away, right? You can interpret that as a novice language learner. Whereas some other programs might show you a waveform or uh, you know, an acoustic spectrogram or something. But then that needs another level of interpretation uh, that the written word does not. So there's, there's my uh, entry. And if I didn't like it, I could click the microphone again and try again. Um, but I'm going to submit this assignment. And what I'm expecting to see is we have this chip and ship minimal pair, right? That's going to be isolated and also this build and built. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, pretty good, 96%. Could almost pass for a native. Uh, and here we have a little bit of feedback. So for any activity you create, there's a leaderboard, right? Now, part of this is to kind of encourage a student, but also in case you as the instructor have a typo in your prompt, right? And you literally make an assignment that's impossible, uh, which happens more than you, you might think. And so you, you, have a, you have a numerical score here, the 96, a little bit of feedback. Uh, and the feedback is, will change in the language that you're using. So if it was in French, bravo, you know, or uh, Spanish, it will change. And I have these two words isolated. And when I hover over these words, and, and you know, if you take nothing else uh, from this talk, uh, 
I want you, everyone to know about Forvo. Everyone know about Forvo.com? So Forvo.com is a crowdsourced uh, audio dictionary of words being pronounced by native speakers. So when I click on to build, I'm going to be taken out of Icebrock, right? I'm going to Forvo. It's going to take me to the, the English pronunciation dictionary. And you can see here, uh, build, five different pronunciations. And you can kind of uh, drill down into some of these and see regional pronunciations uh, across the Anglophone world. Uh, often, uh, almost always, you'll have these related words and phrases, which are really handy also for, for a novice language learner. And then you can listen to, uh, again, this is a crowdsourced database. Build. Right? OK. So that's, um, that's the most basic uh, of, of the student experience. Uh, you as the instructor, again, you're going to have a, a private link. And you, I'll show you how to manage these in a second. And what I will see here as people do the activity is like, OK, Dan, this is the text that was transcribed, the score, how many mistakes were made. And you can sort it by name, by date. Now, uh, what I want to do is uh, show you some, some more features uh, that instructors have. And so right now, you notice we didn't, we didn't log in. We didn't create an account, right? Because uh, I really wanted just uh, an activity generator that you could just knock out an assignment in five seconds, 10 seconds, right? Um, but if you want to go deeper, there's a way to, to log in. And to log in, you know, uh, you can provide your email address and it will give you a link. Or if you're, I mean, I think Cornell, you have both Google and Microsoft logins. I, I normally just connect to my Microsoft login. So here is my, here's my, I'll zoom in a little bit. Here's my instructor dashboard. And you can see here is that assignment that I just made and they're listed uh, chronological, reverse chronological order. And so I can see all of the activities that I've made with this email address. And if I hover over, I can, I can copy the student link. I can click here, copies the student link to the clipboard. I can see all the grades for, for a given activity. I can take, I can do the activity as a student. Uh, and then I have some stats too. Um, so I'm going to go into a French one. I don't want to divulge any actual student data here. Uh, so I'm going to go into this French activity to give you an idea of some of, some of the uh, simple stats that you can get uh, through the tool. So here we have uh, listed alphabetically words that were missed by students doing this activity. And you also have kind of a top five. So the most commonly mispronounced words for, for any given activity. And also, which is uh, uh, new uh, since we got the grant funding, is you can see how students progress over time. Just take a second to load. And so you see here kind of an anonymized student ID with the first score, final score, highest score, how many attempts with some stats. So on this activity, average improvement at 22% for students who repeatedly engage with the activity, right? So somebody who does the same activity more than once, you can kind of see their growth. Now on, on this one, there's not a whole lot of data. So standard deviation is very high, um, but it gives you a sense of the kind of data you can collect and then take back, you know, have a kind of a, a data driven sense of where should my focus be uh, for, for bringing in new pronunciation activities. For some languages, we also support kind of an IPA uh, view, right? So you can get an IPA transcription of, of some of these words. And also, you know, so we have some graphemes here, like, okay, here are the sounds that are consistently problematic for, for, this, for this activity. Uh, I should also show you under missed words, uh, you can drill down into any one of these words also. 
So the French word matin, uh, which is morning, I'm going to click into matin, and it gives you some quick stats, okay, about this particular word. So I have this word in two different activities, this one and another one somewhere in my list. I can see how many times this word's been attempted, how often it gets mispronounced, uh, the success rate, so 85% here. But also, italicized in the bottom, it looks at all of the data. So all ISPROC data and the whole platform. Now this, it's anonymized, it's aggregate, right? But you can see, um, yeah, so besides me, eight other people have this word in some activity, uh, and the success rate of this word is, is 80%. So it kind of gives you a sense of like, and it's, it's also interesting to see because 85% uh, here, 80% here, like, okay, it's probably, there's it's a correspondence there. Okay, what have I not shown you? Um, so make an activity, complete an activity, all right. Uh, the roster, just quickly, and I don't think this is going to, so when I click on my roster, I'll see anybody who has completed an activity. I made sure that you're just seeing my names here. Um, so it shows you who the student's name is, what their email address they provided, uh, how many unique activities they did, and also when you click on to, uh, well, first of all, for the roster, you can see, okay, this is the past 48 hours, but you can drill back a week, a month, six months, or see the past two years of student uh, submissions for any activity. But I want to show you quickly, too, I can drill into, I'll drill, in, drill into myself, that doesn't sound quite right, um, drill into me. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of stuff across a whole bunch of languages because I'm always monkeying with this. Um, so it's going to give me a history of my missed words. You can see I've missed a lot of words uh, over the years in many languages. But one thing that is, again, new to some of the grant funding is for any given student, uh, we can build them a custom review set that's personalized to the kinds of mistakes that they have made, right? So the, as you as the instructor, you can share a, a custom review set for any individual student. And so when I clicked onto this uh, review, I see, all right, the program has prepared 19 activities for me to work on through. And it's gonna be a, a whole lot of different languages and different words. I'm not gonna go through them, but the, the activities are chained together, right? So, well, I'll go through. No, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, because, um, and, the, and this question came up earlier, is, you know, it's great. So if you're, if you're an instructor, you can create an activity, assign an activity, blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you're just an independent language learner and you don't want to play this role of like, okay, so I'm, this, I'm the learner and I'm the teacher, which you could do, right? You could, of course, do that. I do that all the time, but we do have kind of pre-existing turnkey sets, okay? And we have those under our explore menu. So um, what language should we explore? Can I get a suggestion from the, from the crowd? Japanese. Japanese? All right, I'm glad you said Japanese. Let's go to Japanese. I don't know how many Japanese sets we have, um, maybe just a couple. Okay, we have a few. So it looks like we have uh, five that are created. And everything with the star has been vetted um, by somebody. <laughs> it went through an additional layer of uh, scrutiny. So let's go to, because um, I think I can only handle Japanese basics, okay? But to give you an idea of how these are strung together, so it says, welcome, you're about to begin. This collection has 10 activities to get started. And Japanese is great too, because I can showcase one other feature I didn't talk about yet. Okay, so here goes nothing, literally nothing. Uh, all right, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Okay. 
So here I have uh, my text. I believe that says hi, right? Okay. I, I can listen to it. Hi. Hi. And for the non Latin based alphabets, uh, we have a, it's a little subtle, but we have, a, we have an ABC uh, overlay here. And what's going to happen is when I click on this, you're going to have height. So if I'm not familiar with the script yet, I can get a little bit of help. And then height. Okay, submit. Oh, check that out. Yeah. And now you see this large flashing arrow like, hey, go to the next one, dummy, uh, which is what I'm going to do. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, I'm going to cheat. Okay. I'm going to listen. Yeah. 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 It's thinking. It's like you don't sound Japanese. Okay, so, and then there's, there's eight more activities uh, that go on just like that until, until the very end. And you as an instructor, you can, of course, you can build your own sets. You, you create whatever five, six, seven, eight activities just like I showed you. You, you can log on uh, as an instructor. Bum, bum, bum. Let's see here. And... You can you can create a set, and you can see I have I have a bunch of different sets here. You can make your set private uh, when you create it because you just want it for your students. You can also set it to public, so the public sets show up in that explore, right? So if you want to contribute a set to the larger Icebrock uh, community, uh, I would appreciate that, and I, th I think it's great that you can do that. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. So for example, create a new set. Um, okay, street Portuguese. What was I thinking? Uh, I'm going to choose Portuguese. I'm going to keep this set private. And it's going to be added to my, my list of, of sets somewhere under uh, P, very last one. And what's going to happen now, it's going to show me every activity I've ever made in Portuguese. And I can add these to the set. So uh, we'll do this one. So I've added two activities to the set, and then I have a student link that I can share the street Portuguese two activities. Eu preciso de você. Eu preciso do seu cérebro. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that, but it says, I, I need you. I need your brain. Uh, my department chair is from Brazil. I think I said this to him, and I was, I was practicing. Uh, with my, with my own tool. So that's what that's about. And of course, um, you see down here that for a language like uh, Portuguese, there's two models uh, currently, uh, a Brazilian model and a Port Portuguese, Portugal, European Portuguese model. Because uh, again, Brazilian Portuguese too sounds quite distinct uh, from European uh, Portuguese. And hopefully one day we'll be add, able to add more models for the larger Portuguese speaking world. Okay, did I forget anything? Oh yeah, so we saw we saw the dialect support. Uh, so a language, yeah, like Arabic. I think we have uh, fourteen regional models. Uh, Spanish, uh, sixteen uh, models. Uh, French, uh, French for the text to speech. We have a Quebecois voice and uh, a European kind of very normative uh, French voice. So that's, that's that. Um, so other hat uh, is my hat as a researcher. Uh, this article just came out uh, this month uh, in System, which is one of the journals uh, kind of devoted to my field, which is computer assisted language learning. And I, I wrote this uh, as a systematic review that I wrote with two of my graduate students. 
And what we did was we tried to identify as many papers as we could that investigated empirically uh, the impact of automatic speech recognition. Because it's, it's a big kind of, I would say it's not an unanswered question, but it's a question of great interest to, to language educators looking to adopt a tool like this, especially if they're replacing something that seems tried and true. So what we did was we uh, meticulously analyzed uh, what ended up being 50 papers that kind of explored different things, uh, different claims that have been made about the efficacy or impact of automatic speech recognition technology. And we just focused on uh, studies since 2012 because the technology has changed a lot, um, especially around that era. So ultimately what we did was we like, we, we went through all these papers, we looked for themes, common, common claims, and we came up with five claims and we tested uh, how compelling the evidence was for any, any given claim. And so one of the claims is that, you know, these tools, they're, they're effective at isolating errors, right? And they don't, not every tool does this the same way. One common thing that uh, was used in the study was students interacting with Google Docs and just selecting the microphone, selecting the microphone and speaking. And so the feedback they get, it's positive feedback, like, oh, that's the word I wanted to say, and that's the word I see. That's one type of feedback they get. Another type of feedback they get is kind of a substitution, like that's not the word I wanted to say, but that word popped up. And another type of feedback they get is just omission, like I'm saying this word over and over and it's not transcribing. Uh, so again, we looked at 50 different papers uh, and we found compelling evidence uh, across many empirical studies that actually, yeah, it's pretty good overall at isolating errors for, for L2 uh, speakers. Also, the question comes up a lot like, okay, yeah, it's good, but I know, you know, I have firsthand experience, it's not great, right? So what we did was we looked at studies that focus on WER, which is word error rate, okay? And to give you some context, word error rate for a human transcriber is about 4%. Okay. And what we found is with especially modern, uh, modern engines like the Whisper engine, you may have heard people talk about Whisper, modern engines, it's as low as 2%. So often new automatic speech recognition models outperform humans, right? Often. So we found, we found compelling evidence for this claim. And yes, there's, there is loads of evidence showing that uh, L2 learners, when they're interacting with these tools, their pronunciation does improve. There's other ways of improving pronunciation, but those other methods are generally involve a lot of time and energy on the part of the instructor. So also um, there's some counter evidence to this last one, uh, but, uh, Largely, on the, on the whole, uh, when you survey students who have interacted with a tool like iSprock, um, they report a positive student experience. They, they report some sense of benefit, uh, some sense of improvement that they've noticed interacting with these tools. One of, one of the studies we quote, you know, they're like, students decided to agentively use these tools outside of prescribed assignments, right? And that was kind of a reoccurring theme that we saw over and over. In my own department, this is another study uh, where we, we investigated the question, okay, second semester Spanish students, we got 76, I think it was, students, and we divided them in two classes. And one class, the only pronunciation instruction they had was with Icebrock. That was it. And then the other half, we gave them weekly uh, instructor-led pronunciation training, explicitly drawing their attention to certain sounds. Now, the good news is both groups 
improve their pronunciation, which is great. It's kind of what you would expect. Um, but what we found was automatic speech recognition, our ASR, actually improved some targeted phonemes more than the instructor-led pronunciation instruction. We also made this measurement that, again, repeated engagement with the tool. We saw ISPROC uh, activity scores go up on average by 12.5%, which isn't nothing. That same data we share on our, on our website, and this is every bit of data that we had between the years of 2015 and 2022. And you can see there's like a cross-linguistic kind of analysis across different languages. How much do students who make repeated attempts on activity, how much does their pronunciation improve as measured by the tool? Uh, so of course you would, you would expect repeated efforts on something. You would expect some improvement. Uh, but we saw improvement, you know, from 9.9% to almost 15% uh, across different languages. This doesn't really tease out who are these people, right? Um, because maybe for French, they're all advanced learners. Maybe for Japanese, they're 101 learners. We don't collect that data and we can't really tease it out. But, you know, I think it's... Uh, we, we are, the research team is, is pretty convinced uh, that there's a, there's a measurable, you know, benefit to uh, interacting with a tool like Icebrock. Funding and future. So I'm very grateful. Uh, we're currently, this whole project's being funded by the NEH. Uh, we got a sizable grant a couple of years ago and we got matching funds uh, from the SLU Research Institute, um, which is a separate entity from SLU, but uh, they were able to provide <clears throat> matching funds. And so all of this funding has, has paid for some of the research I just spoke about. It's paid for open access to everybody. Um, and it's paid for three years of development where we've been able to add new features to the software. Future plans this summer, we have uh, a team hired to build more of those, like the Japanese set that we saw, to build more thematic sets, uh, mostly gonna be in French, Italian, and Spanish this summer. We have a very robust research agenda in place for uh, what is coming academic year where we're, again, we're looking at cross-linguistic differences, different levels, uh, different classes, time on tasks, attempts, uh, and also student perception, uh, the, the student perception question. And then again, we also want to provide even more support for, for critical languages. Uh, those are languages deemed as critical uh, by the federal government. Uh, so languages like Korean and Turkish and Russian, we want to add more, more dialectical, more dialect support and, and more, more features for those languages. So that's where we are. Oh. <laughs> so again, the website is uh, icebrock.net. You can do .com, you can do .org. We bought them all. Uh, you'll be redirected. And, and that's me, that's my contact. I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, you all might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, Dan, thank you so much for introducing this uh, great tool. Before we take questions from the audience here, um, we do have a question online from Misa. Misa is asking, is there any way to incorporate Icebrog into Canvas, especially into the Canvas quiz or assignment feature? This question is asked quite often. Um, and so we are, I have a, a graduate student right now in computer science, and he is working on the LTI integration for, for Canvas. So LTI, it's, it's a protocol that allows whatever your LMS is to talk to some other tool. 
And so we are in development right now. I'm hoping um, that will be finished this calendar year. Other questions from the audience? Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very oh. much. Very cool technology. I have two questions. Um, one is, how are words segmented for languages uh, written without spaces or have ambiguous uh, word boundaries? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I should probably have shown some examples, uh, like in Chinese. Um, so what we do is, uh, for Chinese, the, the words or the characters that you'll see in the Forvo section, that's, that's by character, right? So you'll get, you'll get character level feedback for words without spaces. Now for Chinese in particular, we also, we convert uh, a string without spaces into pinyin, and then the pinyin has spaces. And then we can also, when you do a Chinese activity, the student will see pinyin feedback with the word separated. So some, some languages that are, yeah, that, that don't have spaces in them, we had to find kind of unique approaches to changing the feedback just a little bit. But I think it's, it's, mostly, it's mostly Mandarin uh, and Thai that don't have spaces. I think every other language we support does have spaces, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question is when you review all the missed words, um, can you still like, when you click on a word, can you still see all the uh, a list of all the um, sentences that included the word uh, that you like practiced before? Uh, as the instructor or as a student? Student. Yeah, the student. So the, the customized student review set, it's going to give you those whole sentences again. Yeah, for review. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, I have another sort of just really specific question. This is fascinating. And I'm wondering when you get the words at the end that you missed, say like you mispronounced the word chip, would it tell you what which part of it to focus on, like the CH or the vowel? Or... No, no, because because everything is all the feedback that ASR can give you is at the word level, right? Um, so the other thing I briefly showed you was the uh, what we're calling IPA insights. And so what that does, it systematically analyzes each word for like where are the common clusters of letters because we're trying to that's the kind of feedback that's like you know that's the holy grail right it's like the feedback we want to give is like okay so it's this consonant cluster it's this blend right um so we're trying to infer where that is but we don't know for sure right so that's it's something we can kind of infer, but we can't say with any certainty. Hi there. Thank you so much for this talk. I have two questions. One is maybe just a little bit more about implementation. So how do you have any sort of like best practices for how to bring this into the classroom? Like, are you thinking at the word and sentence level type activities tend to be more successful or do you ever assign larger ones is this something that happens once per class or is there a batch of activity you know like what are sort of the best practices there and then i'm also thinking right when there is something that has this very normative way of evaluating it there's the possibility that that could be that that could also have this disincentivizing impact. And I'm thinking here possibly of like heritage speakers or there's any number of scenarios. So how have you thought about that? Um, yeah. So yeah, those are the two questions. Great questions. I want to take them in reverse order because um, it's something that's uh, I'm very sensitive to, right? Um, especially when I teach French, um, I'm someone who's spent lots of time in French speaking Canada. And there's this kind of, among some French speakers, there's a sort of linguistic insecurity, right? That their French isn't like normative French, right? There's books and dissertations written on the linguistic insecurity of Francophone uh, Canadians. And so 
what we can do with the technology we have is add those regional models, right? Both uh, the acoustic model that the student can select and also the, the TTS, the text-to-speech. So like French, for example, has a Quebecois voice that you can select as the teacher to override the default, okay? So that's one approach. The other approach, of course, is you as the instructor can record your own voice, right? So if you speak a variety of a language, it's not represented by the technology and the platform, you can use your own voice or you can pull down something from, from YouTube or some other pre-existing audio file uh, that, that you find. So that's the best we can do right now on a technological level. Now, your other question was about best practices. Uh, I have many thoughts on this. Uh, the first one being that I think when you have students use a tool like this or any kind of cutting edge technology, this is best suited for very low stakes, formative uh, practice, right? So even though students get a score, right? The score of the 96, the 36, whatever it is, I tell them that score is for you. Like for me, I want you to do your best. I want you to engage with the tool. And I often say, look, um, work through these activities. And if you don't get a score of 85%, right? Submit it again. Like, let me see a second, a second effort, right? So low stakes, formative uh, evaluation, credit, no credit, right? The other thing I will say is that all kind of these, all these emergent uh, speech technologies, they're all probabilistic, right? So what that means is I'm not gonna put a bunch of, uh, I'm, I'm gonna focus mostly on high frequency lexical items, right? And also put words in a context that makes sense. So, and by context, I just mean, is this sentence coherent as a sentence? What a lot of people will want to do is say, like, hey, um, I want to focus on minimal pairs. And they will literally just type in a list of words. Ship, ship, chip, ship, right? Disk, desk, disk, desk. And the problem is because these technologies are probabilistic, right? If you add even a little bit of context, your, your accuracy rate is going to go higher. So I, I put the disk in the computer. The computer was on the desk. If I wanted to focus on those minimal pairs, I would have enough context for the accuracy to go higher. Now, that also means, um, let, me, let me also say that speech recognition as a technology, it's a lot like spell check. And that spell check was not designed to teach you how to spell, right? So some things will be hyper corrected, right? If you if you say into any um, speech recognition system, I really enjoy eating fist food. Okay, now I said fist, not fast, right? But the ASR might hyper correct it and change it to fast because that's a that's a collocation, right? Those two words are always together. So you have. Uh, with this technology, you have false positives, you have false negatives. But I think, again, this is a, a mechanism for practice that's low stakes and formative. Yeah. Thank you for introducing this. I just have two kind of practical questions. One, I'm trying to think about how to integrate it into the classroom. Um, so I teach international graduate students at Cornell. I teach them English. So like for example, last week they um, were practicing introductions where they shared the research interests, but I'm, I don't give them grades and really this is meant to be self-directed in terms yeah. of a course. So, I mean, how would you recommend they use this in terms of, I mean, would they put their own emails in and they put their own introductions in and get feedback? And I mean, cause I'm not gonna give them a text because it's individualized. Right, and, I, and there's something I will show you real quick. Um, the, the short answer is yes, that's what you would do. They, they would play the role of the instructor and the teacher. Now, I will also show if I start to type something, um, 
let's see English. If I say like, my name is Dan, right? You're gonna get a little bit of feedback right here. I've got to say you can create a wild card because it sees the my name is, and maybe you want the students, maybe their name is not Dan. So you can do wild cards in here. My name is Dan and I am from Mexico. So anything that's preceded by a double asterisk can be replaced by the student and not count against them. Does that make sense? Doesn't make sense. Like meaning a wild card can be anything for a different story. Anything. Yeah, I mean, I was I was thinking a name is very common, right? Uh, I'm from Mexico and I study whatever subject. Okay. So make this more obvious. Oh, what I do? Country? Oh, thanks. So you can you can do a, a prompt like this, and anything that's preceded by a double asterisk will be like a Mad Libs, where the, where the student can substitute that for anything. Yeah, yeah. But um, I yeah, most cases it's the first thing that I suggested, uh, and we have I have my students do this if they're going to be giving a presentation. They can just copy a paragraph at a time and play the role of teacher and uh, uh, teacher and learner, for sure. Thanks. And my second question is, I was just curious about how to um, import an MP3 file or um, the speech of someone else, how that works. Uh, yeah, um, uh, basically you, you, you select, um, I want to upload MP3 file. Um, this has an audio file. Uh, uploaded, whatever. Uh, and on the next screen, it will just ask you to choose a file. Uh, and I don't have no idea if I have a But that's that's the that's the idea. Sorry, I'm not gonna be able to find one quickly. Um, but whatever whatever file you select, right, that will be that will appear in the player for the student. Um, it might be more obvious if I do we do it one now? Um, so I'm going to record my own. This is a quick demo. I'm like, I can listen to it to confirm it's good. I can use this audio. And then when I review this, this activity as a student, this is a quick demo. And I didn't show earlier, but you can slow down. Uh, this is a quick demo, right? And it tries to keep the, the pitch, but slows down the, yeah. Well, so the, yeah, so you will, you include the text and the audio, right? So yeah, sure thing. Uh, two megabytes is, is the limit, which if you have a file that's larger than that, you've probably also exceeded the text input limit, which is about 90 words. It depends. It's actually character-based, so it depends on your language. Because um, like, like Japanese uses many more bytes. Uh, yeah. So we do have another question online. Our friend Jeff Magoto. Oh, hi, Jeff. <laughs> hi, Jeff. So Jeff writes, love the elegance of Icebrock Dan, um, and so have dedicated language students in our self-study Lictal program over the years. In light of the personalization and feedback abundance that Gen AI tools are now offering, are you thinking of ways for Icebrock to be even more individually responsive and informative? So basically more of a student-driven tool while you're not losing all the great data that you're collecting on student progress and perceptions. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. It's definitely on my mind um, because basically it seems like every tool now, like they're trying to shove jet, chat, chat GPT into it, right? In some way. Um, so of course it's been on my mind. And one of the things we're working on was the same thing when I showed the, <clears throat> the IPA insights, right? Uh, one of our uh, kind of functions that we're working on right now is to take that data Right and create novel sentences that uh, bring in those sounds that we're inferring are the problematic sounds, right? Just based on their prevalence. 
so again, if I see this uh, SHCH consonant cluster over and over in the data, then I can feed a request to OpenAI and get a totally original sentence that focuses on that. I, I get a hundred sentences that focus on that and build a individualized uh, set for a student. So that is uh, not available right now to, to the public, but we do have a, a version of that on our, on our development server. So yeah, I mean, the, the goal of course is to have pronunciation instruction be as individualized as possible. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for coming. There was one other um, very brief question on uh, Zoom from Sujata. Can we include visuals with this feature? Uh, no. So uh, there, there's no uh, opportunity to, to include visuals. Uh, it's really, it's meant to be as lightweight as possible. Um, so one of the things that lets us have super quick load times is just holding on to that text and also uh, generating audio, like the, the TTS, only as it's requested. So it's uh, for consideration of speed and just simplicity. Uh, and I have experience from designing another application years ago where like, go wild, whatever you want. And it just, it, I think it created more problems for us uh, than it provided opportunities for uh, instructors and learners. Well, we have time for maybe one more question if there is another pressing one here in the audience or online. The best way to, you know, do anything with this, just play with it yourself. Um, the language you teach, the language you're learning, language you aspire to speak. Um, and yeah, you'll, you'll find it's, you'll find its strengths and its weaknesses. And, you know, over time, you'll develop a second sense for what makes a great activity. Uh, and how can I best implement this into my class? Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dan, so much for joining us here today. Yes. Thank you for having me. And good luck to all of you for the end of the semester. This was the last event in our series for spring, but we look forward to seeing all of you for our end of semester workshop on May 8th. And then again, for what promises to be an exciting series in the fall. So thank you for joining us today.